we're in week three of the Bible study, but it's actually only week two of the text. If you remember the first week, we kind of established some historical context. Last week, we looked through chapters one through four. If you weren't here, I'll kind of give you the whole 40 minutes in about 40 seconds. So here it was. There are four main points that Paul talks about in chapters one through four. Uh, All humanity, this is Jews and Gentiles, are trapped in sin and they need to be rescued. Point two, rescue from our sins will not happen. This is to the Jewish audience. Rescue from sin would not happen from doing their human best to follow the rules of the Torah. Uh, Thirdly, God's righteousness is available through faith in Jesus only. And when we have faith in Jesus, God justifies us or declares us righteous. And then number four, finally, the purpose uh, of Jesus and, and salvation was to include all who would believe into the covenant family of Abraham. And so tonight, we're, we're, again, when we talked about in week one, the entire topic of what the book of Romans is about, the Romans is providing us a doctrine to understand what is the gospel. And so I think it's very, very, very important that we begin to understand what is the gospel because we live in a society that wants to paint a lot of different pictures of what the gospel may be, right? How many have even heard these kind of these concepts and these thoughts that all roads lead to heaven, right? Well, there's only one way to heaven is through Jesus. And, and interestingly enough, there is what we call the Romans road. And, uh, and so Romans gives us such rich uh, doctrine and theology of understanding what the gospel is. So that's really the point that we're going through tonight. And tonight we're looking at how the gospel creates a new humanity. So when we were moving out from Georgia to California, we took a 21-day road trip. And it was incredible, y'all. So I've got, a, I've got a travel trailer, and it's a big, giant one. I don't know if y'all saw it parked in the back of the church until we could get it in storage uh, back in July. And we went to some just incredible places across the United States, and what a beautiful place the United States is. It's always interesting, though, when you go on a trip. We went on, I think it was like nine or ten different stops, and we saw a lot of different national parks or just some really cool places. But... It's always interesting which things kind of like stick out, right? So I'm talking about we, we're going and seeing some of the highest mountain peaks. We're, it's in July, and we're having snowball fights next to Alpine Lakes in, in Nevada. I mean, that's incredible, right? We were seeing the Grand Canyon. We're at Hot Springs in the spas in Arkansas, we go to, uh, I think, Colorado. It's the, the Great Sand Dunes, which is not a very known national park. You should check it out. It's really awesome. There's these just mountains of sand. It sounds not cool, but it really is cool. But it's, it's amazing. We drive th- we, we, on our trip, we drove through uh, Texas. And it's amazing when you would ask everyone on the, on the trip, what are the highlights? Everyone has their own highlight in our family. And interestingly enough, it's, it's typically not like, oh, go in and see in the south room of the Grand Canyon. It's typically these little moments, right? So our kids, when we were in Amarillo for the night, there was a rodeo in town. So we just randomly got to get to the rodeo. And Rowan Hayes, we see world-class views. We stand on the tops of mountains and the rodeo. And, and, and more importantly, the... Um, when the kids ride the sheep, that moment was the apex of this grand 21-day adventure. But for me, I have my own kind of random little moment that was a cool moment. We were in, I even forget the main stop, and we were at the Great Basin. Again, not a very, not a very popular national park. Great, Great Basin National Park. It has some of the oldest living trees uh, in North America, that's, this is where we had the snowball fight in the Alpine Lakes. It's like 100 degrees on the ground and up in the mountains, there's still snow. It's incredible. But while we were there, we're Googling different things, and we find something called Garnet Hill. And for people who are into what's called rock hounding, any, do you know what rock hounding is? You just go and find semi-precious stones on the ground, and it's look for cool rocks. 
Um, we found this place called Garnet Hill, and there are literally garnets, and we, like, everywhere. Now, my dad couldn't find any, but we found, like, seven. He was getting kind of mad that he couldn't find any, and we could. And this is what was so funny. It's one of those things you walked, you walked down this just dusty hill. There's, like, scrubby trees all around, and you're like, how am I going to, how am I, where do we even start, you know? And then you would look, look down, and, and once you found the first one, you knew what to look for. It was one of those things like, what, what are we even doing here? And then you see that first little black speck, and you realize every little black speck is a garnet. And you have to kind of get little tools and knock around them and knock the dust, off, dust and dirt off of them. But there were garnets everywhere. Now, this is just a funny side story. I'm going to get to how this actually applies to Romans here in a second, I promise. But it's, it was so funny and so addicting to find the garnets. <laughs> we're, we're on the ground, and my, we, me and my wife have this pit that we're just, like, digging through and finding these garnets. And my kids are like, Mama, I want to see. She, Baby, I'm finding garnets. Move. And we're just totally invested in finding garnets. And when I, when I look at Romans, Romans reminds me of Garnet Hill. Because on Garnet Hill you could look and there are semi-precious stones like everywhere. And I look through Romans and there are so many scriptures that kind of rank at the top of our list of quotable and retweetable and scriptures that we have on bookmarks or on t-shirts, these scriptures that we live by. Romans is full of it. Romans is full of treasure like Garnet Hill is full of garnets. And so I feel so, like, I, this is how much, I almost literally read the entire chapter of Romans 8 to you guys tonight. But I was like, they'll walk out and leave if I do that to them. But it's like every three verses, the richness and the beauty is there. And so I really, really, really am saying all this to tell you, I want to encourage you to dig into Romans. It is, we're not even able to even, I'm really talking to you like about kind of high points and observations, but if you want to get into the meat and the beauty of Romans, you're going to have to feed yourself some of this. And I want to encourage you, I want to encourage you to feed yourself some Romans, okay? It is full of richness that I think that you guys will totally enjoy. So tonight, as we are uh, looking in, so uh, again, this is one of my favorite scriptures. It's in Romans. Here's, here's your little garnet right now dropped into Romans. Romans 5, 6 through 8. I love this. This is one of my favorite, one of my favorite scriptures. You see, just at the right time when we were still powerless, and I could stop and preach on that right now. Just at the right time, when was the right time? When we were powerless, when your faith was weak, when you didn't think you had it all together, when you didn't think that you were at, at the top of your game, when you were powerless, that is just the right time. And the right time for what Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 7, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good one person someone might possibly dare to die. Verse 8, this is the gospel of Jesus right here. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. You weren't worthy. You weren't in a place to even say thank you. You weren't in a place to even acknowledge it. While you were still a sinner in rebellion, Christ died for you. That's not even a part of our teaching tonight. That's just a little nugget like I'm talking about that Romans is full of. So Mark Berry read a book, I think it was like in the, around the 2010s, it's called Encountering the Book of Romans. And he looks at this portion of scripture tonight that we're, that we're talking about in Romans chapter 5 through 8. And he, and he begins to uh, see something here that what Paul is doing in these three uh, chapters, 5, 6, 7, and 8, that's four chapters I guess, is he is beginning to 
uh, describe something that on, in our title tonight we talk about how the gospel creates a new humanity, right? So he begins to observe this new humanity that God is creating through the gospel. Um, Mark Berry, he calls them the two realms. So we'll call the first one the old realm because no sense in lots of creativity. And the second one, and here's what I'm going to tell you. You cannot judge my spelling or handwriting, okay? We good with that tonight? And so uh, we have the old realm and the new realm. You can also understand this as the old humanity and then the new humanity. You can even understand this as the old society and the new society. And here's the deal is what is happening in the in the uh Like, how do we get from old to new? What is the difference in the things we're talking about tonight? And the difference that brings us from the old realm to the new realm, from the old humanity to the new humanity, is only one thing, and that's the work of Jesus on the cross. And that's what Paul's talking about tonight as we compare this old humanity to new humanity. You've got to understand that at the crux, at the, at the center of all of this, the transition between these two is the work of Jesus on the cross. I'm getting started a little late with all of my uh, stories, a little talkative tonight. So we're going to go through these six observations kind of quickly. Again, I got y'all because I love y'all. At the very end, you'll see all the answers if I miss any. So don't be mad at me. Your answers are coming. So uh, the first thing that we'll see here is in the old realm. Look at me. I'm dyslexic. Y'all got me all nervous. Is Adam in the new realm. There is Jesus. So the first, the first, uh, the first kind of looking at, we're looking at humanity. Who is the head of this humanity? The first in the old realm, we have Adam's sin that left us bound to sin and its consequences. And then in the new realm, Jesus' sacrifice provides a way for us to be justified from our sin. So Paul begins in, in, in Romans 5, you'll see he contrasts these ideas. He talks about the story of creation and Adam and how from one man came all of sin and destruction and all these things. And then from another man, from Jesus, we have salvation. Again, if you read a Bible that has kind of any commentary or study notes, you'll even see that sometimes some theologians will call Jesus the new Adam. Uh, that, that, there, there's... It's just understanding this concept that, that Adam stands at the head as the kind of the father of all humanity of the old realm, right? Adam was the first created, and everything came from him. And so Jesus stands on this new realm. We'll get into some more teaching, but he stands as the first man that all of us can come into the lineage of. So if you do see this kind of this writing, depending on the translation of your Bible or if it has study notes of the new Adam, the new Adam is Jesus because he is the head of the new lineage of the new humanity that God is establishing through the work of Jesus on the cross. So when we are born, we are identified with Adam. When we are born again, we are identified with with Jesus. So the second observation between the old realm and the new realm is the identity that's given to believers. Now, this one's pretty easy. Uh, You'll see Paul talks about the old man and the new man. And Paul, you'll even, maybe depending on your translation, you'll see the old self and the new self, depending on where you're looking at. Again, Romans 6, 4 says this, we were then buried with him, which is Jesus, through baptism into death in order that just as Jesus was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may have new life. So the old man is the self that is patterned after Adam. And that part of us before Christ is deeply ingrained in rebellion against God. 
Uh, so the law is kind of this tool that's in this old realm of things. It tries to reform the old man to get him to turn a new leaf in his own willpower. But the, but, uh, the system of grace understands that the old man can never be reformed. In fact, the Bible tells us that the old man has to die with Jesus on the cross. And so a lot of times, uh, that, that is what the law was doing. It was trying to just reform and change, change the behaviors of the old man. But Jesus came in and he said, listen, the old man, you got to put that man to death so that you can take on this new man. This leads us into our third observation tonight. And this observation is who is the master of your life? In the old way, we were slaves to sin. And, you know, that, that, that's the kind of an understandable term. I think all of us kind of get that. Uh, in, in the new way, it's really interesting. We'll get here in a moment. Paul says that we are still slaves, but not to sin anymore, but to righteousness. Hopefully that's spelled right. You don't have to correct me if it's wrong. Romans six seventeen through 18 says this. It says, but thanks be to God that through you, that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have, become, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. And so Paul uses this term slaves to make it clear that our lives are controlled and dominated by something. Like, there is freedom in Christ, but you are still, your life still will be controlled by something. The Bible says, choose you this day who you will serve, right? So your life will either be controlled by sin your, or your life will either be controlled by righteousness. And so whatever you present yourself to obey, you will become its slave. And here's the deal. Even in this text, when Paul talks about slavery, he even apologizes for using slavery as a reference. Because in the Roman culture, uh, slavery was what was happening a lot. Even people in the Roman church, many of them were living lives of slavery. Interestingly enough, some of these people uh, in the Roman church were so compelled by the gospel of Jesus Christ that they sold themselves into slavery so that they could give that the message of Jesus would go further. And so these, a lot of these people were living in slavery. And so Paul apo apologizes this, but he understands that it hits close home to them, but he doesn't back away from it. He says this, this concept of slavery is an accurate and a meaningful illustration for them to understand how they must be mastered by righteousness. The fourth observation between the two realms is all about the rules. In the old realm, the law ruled. And in the new realm, grace rules. In chapter 7, Paul, the, 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 if, if you'll read, again, I hope you guys are reading this for yourself. The contrast between chapter 7 and chapter 8 are insane. And I don't want to get ahead of myself because of our next point really dives into those areas too. But in chapter 7, Paul really begins to speak to his Jewish audience and begins to ask them some philosophical questions about the law. Because remember, some of the Jews thought that the, the law and in their own self-righteousness was good enough that they could get salvation from it. So Paul even begins to challenge them on their philosophy of why the law exists. Paul 7, Paul begins to, begin to question these things, and he teaches that the law only shows the inability for mankind to avoid sin. 
just want to tell you this. This is in your notes, and I want you to hear this so much. Rules have never and will never fix the problem of the sinful heart. Now, we love to kind of get into this, this concept, especially as parents, and I've got kids. We love to, uh, we can't measure the heart, right? We can't see into the heart. So we love to manage the things that we can measure. And you know what we can measure and you know what we can ass- assess is behavior. So since the beginning of uh, in ancient times in Roman and, and now, a lot of our ideas about spiritual formation are tied to behavior. And Paul is literally telling people back in the day, you, you can't be tied to this legalism of the law because rules will never fix the problem of the sinful heart. Paul even confesses right here in chapter 7, I do things that I don't want to do, and I don't do the things that I do want to do. And the reason of that is because I've got a sinful heart that is wicked. And like I said earlier, the Roman church, so many of these guys were coming out of a Jewish tradition that's rich in history, rich in rituals, rich in traditions, annual feasts, concepts of circumcision, all of these covenants and all of these rules and all of these behaviors that they tied to their thoughts. And so then as the Gentiles were coming into the church, the Jews began to impose some of their traditions onto them. Now, Paul talks about this, these same exact things in the book of Galatians and other places of the New Testament. He calls them Judaizers, if, you'll, if, that, if that term rings a bell. Judaizers were people that were trying to impose their traditions of Judaism onto these incoming Gentiles. And Paul says, hey, listen, your traditions are great. Your traditions are beautiful. Your traditions, they may be a way that you can connect with God. But when you begin to elevate your traditions over the truth, that's when we get into a major, major ordeal. And when we begin to impose our traditions onto other people, that's legalism. And so, again, there are things that, yes, is it, is it cool when people come dressed nice to church? Yeah, cool. Do you sit at home and maybe think, I'm going to dress good because I'm giving my best to God? Awesome. If that's good to you, then you do it. But is there any truth in the fact that if I come straight from the yard with dirty hands and shorts and a hat turned backwards, that I can't access God any more than you can in your, in your nice clothes? Or that I should not be able to come to church or that I should be able to shame, be ashamed to come to church? No, those things are traditions that some people in church have been elevated over truth. And then there are a lot of churches that have this legalistic spirit where we impose our traditions and our opinions over truth onto other people. And this is exactly what Paul is saying in this point right now. He's saying it's not about your rules and not about your traditions. It's about a relationship that's established in grace. Three times in Romans chapter 6 alone, Paul reminds them we are not under the law, but we are under grace. Three reminders in one single chapter. And here's the deal is that grace is really hard for us to process. It is. Now, we love to process it for ourselves. Don't get me wrong. Like grace, when we're receiving grace and when we've messed up, it, it, it is the, the idea of receiving grace, that, that's, that's, that's cool. Maybe sometimes the, uh, the idea of, of us giving grace or us being gracious, that can be a different story sometimes, right? But I think it's even difficult for Americans, maybe even more than other people, the concept of grace. Because here's the deal, is like we are individualist, right? We're all about our personal freedoms and our personal destiny and achieving our American dream. The, the, the kind of the uh, pinnacle of American success is to be self-made and to achieve your own destiny. Like we celebrate in our culture when people get that way. 
We like formulas. We like cause and effect. We like to know that what we do produces consequences, which, which hopefully in a good sense would promote us to the next level of success. But grace has nothing to do with what we do. Like, you cannot achieve grace. I don't care if you're the most successful person in the room. I don't care if you've got enough money in your bank account to pay off my mortgage right now. I don't care how many hours you worked last week. I don't care how many degrees are on the back of your name. I don't care how many people report to you in your downline. There is nothing that you can do, no accomplishment that you can have that qualifies you for grace. Grace is freely received. And I think, again, for us, the way we're wired in our culture, that's difficult for us to understand. We like rules because rules provide answers. We don't like grace because grace is sloppy. But Paul tells three times in one chapter, you are not under the law, but under grace. Grace calls us to repentance and holiness but stands in contrast with legalism. So let's not be legalistic, amen? The fifth observation is an issue of power. In the old realm outside of Christ, we are dominated by the flesh. Oh, that's a terrible E. In the new realm, check this out, with Christ, we are empowered by the Spirit. So let me just warn you, again, Romans 7 is like real depressing. Any of you guys familiar with the kind of Psalms of David? Sometimes it gets into like, woe is me. I'm a terrible person. I'm not worthy to see the sunlight. Just take me out, God. It's just like, wow, bro, chill out. It's, it, it, it seems like Paul is trying, it, it kind of gets in one of those modes in, in, in Romans 7. It is, it's, it's really depressing as Paul begins purposefully to establish the doctrine so that you and I understand that we are powerless to sin. In your flesh, in your own strength, in your own willpower, you cannot beat sin. You can't do it. And for centuries, the Jews thought that, well, we've got an extra little tool to help us, which is the law, it tells us which behaviors that we should have. So they would accommodate their behaviors to follow the law, but really their heart was wicked and it was far from God. Romans 7, 21, 24 says this. So I find this at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, verse 23, but I see another law at work within me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man am I who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. It's like, wow, Paul, easy, bud. It's okay. Check this out. This is the last sentence in Romans 7. This is what Paul says. So then I myself, in my mind, am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. And it really begs us to ask the point, if we can't beat sin ourselves, what, what's, what's the point of life? And this is the reason that Paul paints such a bleak picture in Romans chapter 7. Because Romans chapter 8 is coming. And let me just tell you, Romans chapter 8 is, it is incredible. Listen, if you didn't do your reading, you've got to go home tonight and read Romans chapter 8 and then run around your block, sprint around your block, because it will make you feel good. So Paul says this, the only way to become free of sin is through the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. 
You can't do it in yourself. You need the Holy Spirit to help you. Romans 8, 1 through 6 says this. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Let's get down to verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But praise God, the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. So let me just tell you, do yourself a favor. Read Romans 8 when you go home. When you go home. Romans 8 is, I, I just picture like this locker room talk. It's like after Tennessee beat Alabama. They're in, the, they're in the locker room and they are partying and they're living it up. This is what I feel when I read Romans chapter 8. And this new spirit and power, and the, the, what, what it gives you and what it gives me is access to life and peace and sonship with God. And no matter what you're walking through, no matter if you came up here tonight and you, would, you stepped out and, and with, with boldness and said, hey, right now it feels like my situation's overwhelming. Guess what? When you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, you have peace. In every trial and every situation that you're walking through in life, you have life, peace, and sonship with God. So again, I'm just going to tell you, you better go home and read Romans 8. And when you see me on Sunday, I want you to be like, man, that was some good stuff. All right, I've got 10 minutes. We can definitely get through this and have a few minutes here. The last contrast is our destiny. The old realm condemns us. To death. But the new realm gives us a way to eternal life. Check this out. Romans, this is in your notes. I apologize. I added it last minute. Romans 6, 23 says this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, I just want to tell you, I was a youth pastor for, for a few years, and um, there was a disconnect with this scripture. Because I think the church has done a poor job at this, if I'm just honest, especially in ministering to young people. Is we kind of harp on that the wages of sin is death, and we make it seem as though sin is not fun. Y'all, sin's really fun. Like, am I going to be fired for saying that? But Rich Guerra, please take his credentials away from him. Like, sin can be very thrilling. It can be very fun. There are some short-term pleasures in it that, you, that, are, that, that, are, that are great. And so we miss it here when we tell people that sin is not fun. Sin is fun because what happens is we've raised a whole generation thinking that sin's not fun and then they experience that sin is actually fun and then they think you've lied to them about everything. Oh, sin is a blast. But when it comes time to pay the tab, when all of those things come to their full fruition, it's death. So it may be fun for a season. It may have even been fun for, for, for some years. Maybe even been fun for a decade or two. But it all eventually leads to death. But here's the contrast. But the gift of God is eternal life. Romans 5, 20 through 21 says this, The law brought us in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, woo, grace increased all the more, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So guess what? In life... Things may be hard. Things will be hard. Let's be real. There will be moments that you feel overwhelmed. But the ultimate benefit 
Because again, let's, let's contrast that. We, we've done a bad job of teaching sin is bad and living for Christ is good. Man, sin is fun and living for God is, it stinks sometimes. Like I lose a lot of freedoms by following Jesus. I limit myself from a lot of friends when I follow Jesus. I can't do all the things everyone around me wants to do. I can't have the temporary fun when I follow Jesus. So we've got to get this, 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 right, this right understanding when we're teaching our next generation. Guess what? It may be temporarily fun to follow the Lord, but the eventual outcome is death. It may stink to sacrifice and follow Jesus, but guess what? The eventual reward is eternal life in Christ. So tonight, I've just got a few more minutes. I'm going to close with a few questions as we kind of recap these points tonight. If I look at this new realm, this new humanity, like this is the model that, that us as Christ followers should be living. These are the attributes. This should be our society. This should be our realm. This should, let me move that so that you guys can see it in the camera. Got y'all right there. You know, my people, I got y'all. So this should be the realm that we are living in. This should be, in contrast, the realm of the world. Paul even says this in his writings. He said that we are to be aliens, right? And, 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 and in church world, we all oftentimes want to like call out the world for how they're acting. Can you believe they're trying to pass this horrific bill on abortion right now to kill babies all the way up to the point of birth? Yeah, I can believe it. That's how they're supposed to act. They are under this old realm. It is you, it is me who are called to be aliens. We're called to be different. There's a whole different type of rules for the humanity that we are supposed to live under in this realm because we have been transformed by Jesus and his work on the cross. So let me just ask you a few of these questions tonight as we close for some reflection. The first one, am I in Christ? The second one, am I the new self? Here's how you can ask yourself that. Does my life re reflect the transformation of Jesus Christ? Maybe another question that's a little bit deeper is, was there a time in my life where my relationship with Jesus was deeper than it is now? Is what God is doing in me, is it new? Is it fresh? The last, the, this ne the next one, am I a slave to sin or am I a slave to righteousness? The next one, am I ruled by the law or am I ruled by grace? Here's how you can ask yourself that. Am I more concerned about keeping up appearance, appearances of holiness to others than I should be? Are you more worried how other people perceive you and trying to keep up with the Joneses spiritually so that someone thinks that you're just extra saved because that happens in the church a lot right here's another question have i elevated my traditions above the doctrine of grace because paul's not just suggesting it paul said there's a doctrine of grace he says you are not under the law but you are under grace next am i dominated by the flesh or am i empowered by the spirit you can ask yourself this, what kind of things are my mind set on? You can ask yourself this, does anxiety rule me or do I have confidence and faith in God? Finally, are you condemned to eternal death or to eternal life? Do you know and love Jesus, accepting him to be the master of your life? And so I want to I, I pray for you tonight. I, it, it, is, it is my kind of just stereotyping thought of this crowd that this is the core of the church. This is the one that shows up, and when Pastor Mendy hits the first chord of the first song, we're ready to worship. You ain't got to warm us up. We're ready to go. Right? Like, we ain't even scared. We'll call them up right back now. We'll go back into worship, have an afterglow service. 
I'm just kidding. Look at him. He's smiling over. He's ready to go. <laughs> but I, 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 if, if, if I fear, if I look at these, these things and I stereotype our room kind of as the mature crowd, as the core crowd, the one that really kind of uh, is something we have to ask ourselves is this one. Are we ruled by the law or are we ruled by grace? Are we a people that embody the grace of Jesus Christ? Like the scripture that we talked about in the very beginning, Romans 5, 6 through 8. God demonstrates his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is grace modeled for us to display to other people. Not to say, well, did you measure up? Well, did you, um, could you please change your clothes and wear less revealing clothes? Or could you please watch your language because there's kids around? And again, I'm all for wholesome things and protecting our children. Don't get me wrong. But sometimes we, we, we impose where we are in our journey on people to where people are on their journey. And God has called us to have grace to lead them to, as we're all having a journey towards Christ. So I am fresh out of time, but I want to pray for you as we go. I want to pray pray a blessing of you that you will be people that will be aliens in this world. That you'll be marked by a different humanity, by a different society, by a different set of rules that when people see you, they'll be like, huh, you know what? They're acting kind of different because they're not under this old realm They're under this new realm because they've been transformed by Jesus. So, God, I pray for your people tonight. Lord, I thank you that we can come and learn from your word. Lord, and we can grow from it and be challenged from it. God, words that you inspired an author to write centuries ago are still alive and true for us today. God, thank you for your word that it never returns void unto us, God. God, help us be people that extends your love and your grace, or that your grace that draws us all onto a journey of becoming more like you. God, help us to be your hands extended. God, your mouthpiece, your, your hope, your love, your joy to everyone we come in contact with. Keep us all safe as we leave this place. Lord, we love you. And it's in your name we pray. Everybody said, amen.